So today we have special guest speakers, which is super exciting. Um, Alicia and Esther are here to talk to us about orientation and mobility. This is us, the um, monitoring team. I'm Jennifer. We have Ashley and Julie, our Wrangler, are here with us. Um, we always start with our contact information, reach out anytime with any questions, and I will turn it over. Okay, hopefully you can all hear me. I'm going to try to speak up and speak clearly. Um, so my name is Esther Butler. The first page of this is actually wrong. <laughs> this was taken from one of my colleagues, so it has her name on it. Um, my name is Esther Butler. I'm an orientation and mobility instructor with the uh, main division for the blind and visually impaired. Uh, my colleague Alicia was supposed to be here, but she wasn't able to join today. So she's also included on the, the end of this PowerPoint, but she's not here today. Um, so we were asked to come and speak uh, just to sort of reintroduce ourselves as providers um, to you folks. Um, and to sort of give you a rundown, very quick, hopefully, rundown of what orientation and mobility, or O&M is what you'll, I'll refer to it as, um, what that service is and how we provide that service to our education caseload, um, and how we work in, as part of an IEP or a 504 or an IFSP team. So, um, so yes, uh, we, I am with the Division for the Blind and Visually Impaired, and we are under the um, Department of Labor under the Bureau of Rehab Services, then the Division for the Blind and Visually Impaired, and then that's where we are housed. We, years ago, were under DOE. We've been pushed back to, to DBVI. Um, so orientation and mobility uh, instructors, there's, uh, just so you know, there are typically 11 of us uh, employed through DBVI. We're down to about eight. Um, even less because there's people on maternity leave and things like that right now. So um, there's about eight of us right now throughout the state. Um, and we provide services across the ages. So we actually provide services from zero to womb to tomb is what we call it. A little macabre, but that's what we call it. <laughs> um, so O&M and how it relates to you folks and what you'll sort of see is that um, we are listed under a related service under an IEP or a 504 plan. Um, we are, so it's under, as through IDEA, um, we were designated as one of the related services that is required and is appropriate to be provided for children who are blind or visually impaired. Um, we also, it's under the ECC or Expanded Core Curriculum, which many of you probably know is those nine areas of um, sort of in special nine areas of, of learning that might require specialized instruction for our students who are blind or visually impaired. Those are typically things that a typical sighted student incidentally learns. Um, and those are things that we teach our students. Um, so that's the ECC. Um, so an O&M comes onto the team typically, um, hopefully the earlier the better. So we do work with CDS as well um, for those younger um, zero to three age groups zero to five I guess um, students and the person that provides the assessment and instruction is what's called a certified orientation and mobility specialist um, we in Maine you are required to be a comms to provide services to, to provide the O&M instruction or an intern that's supervised by um, a certified instructor um, we are all master's level educated individuals um, with a degree in either education and specializing in vision studies. So we are, we're not doctors. We are not medical doctors by any means, um, but our specialty is in vision. Um, many of you have probably interacted with what's called a TVI or a teacher of the visually impaired. Um, we work very closely with the TVI. They are employed through Catholic Charities. They're a contracted partner with us with the division. Um, TVIs can screen for the need for O&M, um, but if they decide or if they determine that a student needs training or a proper assessment, that's where an O&M instructor would come in. Um, and 
we are typically, again, listed under related service, and all the things that um, go into a IEP or an IFSP are different materials or equipment that might be needed that we are recommending for a student, um, as well as physical and environmental um, adapta adaptations and accommodations that might be needed to make sure that a student can access their um, educational environment and their community, and I'll get into that, um, the best. So we'll go to the next one, thank you. So just a very quick um, breakdown of who provides services. It can get really confusing because we are multiple agencies that sort of all work together. So from sort of the top of the pyramid, I guess if you look at it that way, um, is the Division for the Blind and Visually Impaired. So DBVI is who provides the O&M instructors. Um, we are, that's who we are employed through. But there's also, and you probably will interact with um, this person is a BLRS, a Blindness Rehabilitation Specialist. They sort of act as the liaison to families um, and schools and the blindness services um, for that zero to 14 age group. Um, that is pre-VR, pre-Vogue Rehab. And so oftentimes we, uh, we found that that age group often gets sort of lost. And there's a lot to juggle and a lot to know that really falls onto parents. And so the BLRS, sort of functions in that sort of way as a support for not only the family, but also the educational team. Um, and our, BL, our BLRS, in, I'm out of the Bangor office, we have um, three um, throughout the state. One's based out of Bangor and covers Bangor North. One's based out of um, Lewiston, or excuse me, Augusta, and then one's based out of Portland. Um, so they're a great, great resource, and I can get you their names. They're sort of changing uh, positions, so there's been some vacancies. But um, so those, that's through DBVI, and those are probably going to be the main people that any of you would, would interact with as the blindness rehab um, specialist and the O&M instructor. Um, we are a no-cost service through contract with the Department of Education. So when we come onto the team, um, our services as, you know, as mobility instructors, there is no extra cost for us to be involved. Um, our services are also not um, reimbursable through main care or anything like that. Um, so the nice thing is, is that we're just sort of, we come right in and we can go right out. We don't, there's no, um, you know, there's no extra um, hoops that you have to jump through to be able to have our services um, provided. The other sort of, the two contract providers that we um, work with are Catholic Charities Maine. Um, they employ the teachers of the visually impaired um and they are certified teachers who specialize in specific instruction for children who are blind or visually impaired um, and they provide educational services from birth all the way through uh, high school graduation um and so many of you have we have there's i think 20 tvis 20 or so tvis throughout the state and you've probably interacted quite a bit with with many of those folks and then the last um, sort of partnered, uh, contracted partner that we have is probably one that you recognize, many of you might. It's called the IRIS Network, and they're based out of Portland. And they um, provide the Vision Rehab Therapist, or VRTs. Um, VRTs don't really come into the picture until a student is over 14. Um, they don't typically work with the really young students, but they, I, I sort of look at it as the VRTs kind of pick up where the TVIs don't not leave off, but they sort of fill in that older gap. Um, so they're work, working on activities of daily living, independent living skills um, that include um, home management, personal care, recreation, low vision services, um, technology, that sort of thing. So those are the three sort of major players um, that you might sort of see named or listed or whatever or interact with um, that sort of make up the the overarching vision rehab team so criteria for o m services um, maine is a little bit different in that um, for our for our students and for our adults we look at a functional limitation so if if a tvi say or a, or a parent if you get a student that comes in and they have a diagnosed visual impairment, um, we don't always work with every student. So someone, a student may um, have a diagnosed visual impairment, but they may be functioning 
perfectly um, well, and there's no limitations to accessing either their educational um, materials or their environment. And so we may not be involved. Um, but we look at a functional vision impairment that prevents a person from carrying out the activities of daily living independently and confidently, gracefully, effectively. That's, it's all, we sort of look at it all. Um, functional is really determined by an O&M instructor based on not only observation, we have particular criteria that we look for. We talk with the whole team. We get all sort of input to see how really does this vision um, loss impact a student's ability to get through their day. Um, and sometimes this next step is in familiar places, a, per, a person may function normally, but in specific situations, they may need our services. And so how that kind of complicates things, I think, is that for mobility specifically, oftentimes, many times, a student functions very well in their school environment, especially if it's a small school, they've been there for several years or whatever it might be. They're very comfortable. It's a very familiar place. They don't need us in school, but their vision loss doesn't stop once the school day ends. So we also then come in and look at what, what is the rest of their life and the rest of their days look like. So they may need community-based instruction. Um, so we don't just work in the school. We can come in and do um, O&M and stuff specific to school environments, but a lot of what I, we do with our students is outside of school, after school, outside of school hours, community-based instruction, because they need to be able to get to school. If they're going to walk to school, they need to be able to learn, know how to cross streets safely and to do that effectively. So we work on street crossings. We work on navigating in rural environments, we work on navigating in urban environments. So there's a whole extra layer to mobility that is not just we go into a school building, do what we need to do for an hour and we leave. Um, in fact, a lot of my lessons are like two plus hours because there is a lot that goes into teaching O&M, especially in the community. Um, so, and we often, we prefer to provide um, O&M in sort of natural environments. So in your home, in your school, and in your community. Um, it just doesn't, you can do, a lot of folks will do in, in center-based instruction, and you can control a lot of that, but things often will very much likely change when a student leaves like a center-based place. So we do itinerant services, we're going into their natural environment and sort of figuring out how to make that environment work for them. Um, services are client and family focused and centered. So everything we do in terms of how we approach services, we try to include family members, siblings, parents, um, and all sort of team members. I often work very closely with PTs and OTs because all of the vision and vestibular, all of that is connected. So we don't work in a bubble um, at all by any means. And so uh, we take a very team-based approach to try to make sure that we're getting services completely, everything's being covered sort of from a holistic approach. Let's go to the next slide. So um, O&M, orientation and mobility, is, is literally what it sounds like. Um, orientation is knowing where you are in space, um, where you are and where you want to go in relation to other people, places, and things. And mobility is how you're going to get there. So, um, you know, when we work with a student, we do a lot of, and, and this is, I think, for a lot of different services that are provided, we break down sort of the theoretical part of things. And then the mobility is, how are we going to do that? How are you physically going to navigate from your classroom to the cafeteria or from your classroom to the playground and vice versa? Um, how, you know, are there ways how are you navigating stairs? How are you doing those things? So th that is mobility. Um, mobility or O&M can be provided to a student, even if they are not your not typically ambulatory um, or not ambulatory at all, because there are concepts and um, skills that can be taught. Again, we, we teach babies. So there are concepts and skills that can be worked on with a student who may not be um, a typically ambulatory. Um, we work with folks 
and students who are wheelchair users um, who use uh, many of our students use a, a long white cane. We work with, with the really young little kids. We work with their parents on how to navigate and how to be mobile with the stroller, um, using holding your hand, crawling, all of those things. And so um, mobility isn't limited, which is really kind of pretty cool, I think. Um, yeah, so it helps, O&M helps children learn about and interact with the world around them. Um, and so, and I think we get into this on the next slide, that much of what we do with O&M is um, related to, with the, especially with the younger kiddos, is related to play and exploration and reach, going beyond your arm's reach, realizing that there is a, an entire world that is beyond your personal body space. Um, a lot of our little ones that come in um, don't, they're, they're having to learn that concept. And so you think, oh, they're not interacting, they're not playing. Well, they just don't have any idea that there is stuff beyond arm's reach. Um, so a lot of what we do, this is a very basic breakdown of sort of the areas and skill that we work on. Body image, body movement, how your different parts of your body relate to other parts of your body and how that works with um, the tools that you're using. Sensory skills, so kinesthetic and proprioceptive, tactile and olfactory, um, utilizing visual, your visual skills efficiently, um, utilizing auditory information and how to interpret that um, age appropriately, because it's all very different if you're very little versus working with a high schooler um, who is doing those things. Spatial, quantitative and temporal concepts. Um, we do basic skills like human guide and self-protection. Orientation skills, again, this goes back to sort of the or what O&M what is. Um, so learning general orientation, learning how to understand, like understand what landmarks are, mapping skills, whether that's tactile mapping, using electronic mapping, using um, GPS and other uh, tech, uh, technology to be able to navigate through your environment. Uh, cane skills, which is related, it's referencing the long white cane that many of you probably have seen. It's a white and red cane with various tips. Many kids and many adults use them, but many don't. Um, often what we do when we do come in for an assessment is to see if a cane would be useful. Um, and, and sometimes it's not needed in a school building, but they need it for field trips, or they need it if they're gonna be going off campus for whatever reason, or navigating somewhere outside of school that's uneven terrain. So that's all part of the assessment process as we look and see if that is something that a, a, a tool that may be useful. And it may end up being something that comes further down the road as a student gets older, a little bit more mature. Um, sometimes a cane can be, it's not appropriate when they're really young. It becomes sort of um, a projectile <laughs> or a weapon. Um, so we work on trying to figure out when would be the best time to reintroduce that. And is there a way to sort of slowly get that introduced, um, that is safe, that sort of thing. A big part of what we do as a student gets older, um, usually around, well, it, it's usually like eight is when I really start to, and it depends on the parents and what their, what, you know, what their concerns are, but when we really start to push out to community travel. So that's when we will go, uh, a student and I will go to grocery stores. We work on street crossings. We work on navigating in residential environments. Um, and so that's really the focus of our lessons that we do is looking on how do you ne um, negotiate with in vehicles and um, dealing with being a passenger in a vehicle, learning pedestrian sort of rules as a pedestrian. Um, we learn about public transportation. Again, it's all age appropriate, but we, um, we sort of start looking into that sort of thing. Um, and that gets sort of heavier as the student gets older and they're pushing out into the community more, being out with friends, that sort of thing. And then some of the miscellaneous stuff that we work on with folks is how to advocate for yourself, how to discuss your vision loss um, with your peers, with your teachers, with um, you know, whoever's in your, in your circle, um, and accessing technology, um, the difference between sort of rural and urban environments, atypical travel, things like that. Um, and then in Maine, we have the thing of 
weather. So we focus a lot on how to navigate in winter versus navigating when there's no snow, that sort of thing. So are there any questions so far? No? Okay. So um, sort of what I mentioned earlier is that with our very young students, we, um, much of what we do is through play. As is, you know, you see that with PTs and OTs, we're just trying to get kids involved, aware, we introduce, you know, we do a lot of toys, we do a lot of um, scavenger hunts, we do a lot of really fun things to try to get them interested. Um, and also sort of thinking about the fact that I, it's not just me, I'm not just this, I don't, I'm not in a silo type thing. Um, so there's, it's based in play and exploration, we do, um, we work on lots of sensory, introduction to sensory, different sensory things. Uh, and the TVIs, the teachers, also do this and we do this sort of in conjunction with one another so if they're working on a particular skill with a student if they're doing pre braille for, for instance we then I will then introduce heavy tactile um, practice so lo looking at how to get different tactile information so if they're becoming more and more aware of what tactically what they're um, experiencing in their environment and then that sort of carries over to what they're doing in school or in with their TVI. Um, so we try to utilize a mobility aid, offering choices um, like a white cane. We do pre canes with folks. We I built we build pre canes. That's just getting used to the fact that you're you have something in your hand. Sometimes a lot of you know we can spend I can spend a long time on just that tactile defensiveness. You put a cane in a kid's hand, they're like nope. And so we work on just reintroducing that and like keep putting it in their hands and eventually hopefully they'll hold it they'll keep hold of it <laughs> and then you can kind of go from there um so again and that's a lot of patience as you all know just sort of re trying some stuff to get them to keep to, to sort of latch on to one of those things um we work on developing their curiosity and calming the fears of the unknown um it's really tricky it can be tricky. Um, some kids, you get them and they're like, yep, this is it. This is doesn't I'm fearless, doesn't bother me. But then you get the kids that are really, really sort of timid and nervous and are very aware that they have a vision loss, especially if they've acquired their their vision loss. Um, and though that can be really hard because you're you're sort of um, if you're dealing with a, a young child or a student even, or even an older student who has acquired vision loss, who has acquired a, a vision loss, um, you're sort of working through that adjustment process with them um, before you can even get to, here are the skills that you need to know. That is entirely overwhelming. If you, I mean, some kids can handle it, a lot can't, and our adults can't even. So there's a huge process, and that's why with CBVI specifically, we really approach things from a holistic standpoint because it's not just, oh, your eyes don't work, and now we got to teach you these skills. We have, there's a whole, they're grieving the loss of their vision, potentially, um, the fact that their lives are changing. And it can be really tricky when you get a student who, say, is in like middle school and they start to have some vision loss. Middle school stinks as it is. And then you add in, oh, I'm losing my vision or my vision is changing. Um, you know, I have a, a student, I have several students actually in the Ellsworth area. And I think of one who for, a, for several years was like, great, cool, great, hit middle school. And he was like very aware that he had a vision impairment <laughs> and then decided he didn't want to use his cane. He didn't want his friends to know that he couldn't see. Um, so he'll still do my, he'll still do lessons. He uses his cane on lessons, but it's it's that sort of fine balance and dance that I have to do with these students to sort of um, give them a little bit of grace, but also you sort of work through some of that. Um, it's it's tough, <laughs> um, but we all you know we're working on fostering independence, the adjustment to vision vision loss not only for the student but for families. It can be really traumatic for um, families to and parents. Uh, even if, like I said, even if a student is a, a child is born congenitally with a vision impairment, it could be progressive. Um, there's other things that could be going on medically that could impact their vision. And so it's a lot to have to sort of unpack. Um, and 
like I said, there could be other disabilities and things like that um, that sort of impact a, a child's ability to navigate in their world. Um, so we take it as slowly as we need to. Um, the nice thing about O&M or the, the, the different thing, and I think in comparison to what many people know for services like OT or PT, is that we don't stop. We don't end. There is no end point for us because your vision doesn't end. You may get to a point where your vision is, per, is stable and you no longer need to learn certain skills. Like you're, you've gotten enough instruction to be able to function in your current environment and your current circumstances. But you can always come back to us. So we often will have students that we, they may not need services right away. And then in a few years, they've switched schools or they're getting older, things have changed. They come back for a reassessment because we do reassess every three years triannually. Um, and we may find that in three years, they might need services. Um, or we work, might work with a student all through school, they graduate, they go off to college, and then they come back to us after they've graduated college because they've moved. Um, and again, we work with all ages so they can come back to us. Um, so that's the, the, you know, the nice thing is that we do have that longevity. We're with, I said this this morning to another group that we're sort of in it for the long haul. Um, and we always will continue to follow. We don't really stop following a student even if we close them and, or they no longer need our services. Um, someone, whether it's an O&M or a TVI, seems to always be connected. And so we always kind of keep kids on the radar, even if they're not getting services at that, at that a specific point. Um, which is helpful. Um, so future implications about um, for with O and M. Um, so it impacts your decision making skills. Your, we work on problem solving, goal setting, self advocacy, confidence, um, identity. So this all goes back to you know advocating for yourself, understanding for yourself what your vision impairment means and 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 how that impacts you, and then how you want to present that to your world. Um, so we, especially with our like elementary school, we work really hard on like, um, you know, working on how to describe how you see, what are your challenges, not, you know, not going into detail, that sort of thing, but, but really sort of how, if you, if someone, if you needed to explain to someone, how would you explain to them what you see, how you see that sort of thing. Um, and it really all, ultimately leads down to independence. And so my goal is to really, my goal is to work myself out of a job so that someone has enough skills under their belt that they're like, I don't need to come back to you because I already know I have enough in my toolbox that I can, I can do these transitions. I can transition from one school to the next. I'm okay. I know what to ask for. I know how to advocate for myself. It doesn't always happen that way, which is why we're always involved for the most part, um, because but a lot of my students do a lot of the heavy lifting in that respect because you know they'll they'll go up to their next grade and they might move parts places in the building or whatever and they do most of the groundwork and then I kind of come in and be like well let's let's check out this let's do this um, and so that's major when I can get a even an, a, a, a well, if I can get a high school student to do it but I've had elementary and middle school students who are able to sort of say like this is what I need this is how this is what works best for me in terms of, you know, positioning within the classroom, um, if they need things marked for high contrast on stairs, doorways, that sort of thing, their locker. Um, a lot of my students will do that on their own, which is huge, and I love that. Um, and I just sort of fill in the gap. So, we do the next slide. So, um, one of the things that you, you know, you've probably seen, as we talked about a little bit, is the white cane. The white cane is a tool, it's a mobility tool. Um, it is basically meant to be an extension of oneself. So it's meant to give you warning in the distance, not, um, it gives you about a few feet of, of warning in front of you tactily, right? So someone will sweep their cane in front of them. It detects curbs, drop-offs, changes in terrain, um, if they've hit a, a solid surface like a wall, that sort of thing. Um, it is not referred to as a stick. We like to put that in every presentation just because it is a white cane or a long white cane. Um, it has a proper name um, and that is what it is referred to. But most, a lot of people call it a stick. 
not, um, I do have a student that called it the stick of stupidity for a long time. Um, he was, it was a lot. <laughs> he, he was a hard one. Um, he was a hard one to get, to get under, like to get with the O&M. He was not happy about it. Um, but so a lot of folks are white cane users, but like I said earlier, a lot of folks aren't. Um, or only in certain circumstances. And so, especially with your students throughout school, again, you might notice that they bring it with them, keep it in their backpack or in a particular classroom. They only pull it out when they are maybe navigating through the halls or if they're gonna go off campus for a field trip, that sort of thing. Um, that does not, the amount that someone uses a white cane does not um, like dictate their level of ability like so if someone you know i think often we think well they're not using their cane all the time so they obviously can they, they're fine they're not visually impaired they're not that visually impaired um and that's not the case our vision fluctuates throughout the day um it can fluctuate day to day month to month it can be impacted by medication it can be impacted by stress and lack of sleep um and it could just be impacted by environment so schools are often they've got You've got the awful fluorescent lighting. Um, a student could be fine for the first two hours of the day, but after sitting in a class and being under fluorescent lighting, um, that sort of thing, they start to experience visual fatigue. They get migraines, um, eye pain, eye watering, that sort of thing. Uh, that really all then impacts your ability to navigate because your circumstances have shifted. Um, so the white cane, like I said, it, it assists with exploring and previewing the area around the person. It provides tactile and auditory feedback. So you can hear with a white cane the difference between surfaces and the floor. Sometimes if a, uh, a floor is like hollow underneath, you can hear that. Hear the difference obviously between uh, carpet and tile and different types of tile and um, that sort of thing. It provides protection for the lower half of your body. Um, and it ex allows a person to continue to travel while like utilizing the best of their vision to interact with their environment. So a lot of times, especially someone who has field loss, they're staring down at their feet because they're afraid that they're going to trip over something or run into something. The cane sort of takes that away. And then you can use, you know, we, I often tell folks, I'm like, head up, keep your head up because you want to be able to utilize as much of your remaining vision as you can. Um, I know a lot of us as instructors are of the camp of we, if you have it, we're going to use it as long as it's not hurting you to use your vision. We're going to teach you how to use it effectively and efficiently. Um, I don't, I, I don't necessarily, I don't go immediately to, we're going to teach you how to be a non-visual traveler. It's not always appropriate. Um, and so, the cane allows someone to be able to be a visual traveler, but taking out some of that stress um, and, they, and the cane sort of does that work for them. It also helps with identification. And for a lot of the students that you'll probably see, many of them, um, they don't like that part of it, <laughs> that it does uh, identify them as being quote unquote different or why do you use that? Um, it can be a great teachable moment for some of our young students. And in, for a lot of folks, um, they like to have that conversation, um, but it can also be a big barrier for a lot of students to be open to using the cane because it does identify them as maybe not being visually impaired um, because a lot of folks don't, in the sort of greater community, they may not know what the cane is, like why exactly someone's using that cane and they may not understand the colors, the red and white color. But I have found in the last 10 years that I've been doing this, that it really does, it, it lets, whether someone knows why or what the colors mean, it changes their behavior to some degree. So when you're in a grocery store and you have your cane with you, or if you're in a school hallway and you have your cane with you, people just move, it parts the waters as it were, right? Like, so it's sort of without the student or the, the client having to say anything or explain them, whatever, it just, people get out of the way. <laughs> Maybe it's fear of being hit, I don't know. Um, but either way, it does it does the trick. Um, and I find that with my young students, uh, the cane, again, it can be a good conversation starter. Some kids are really interested in like, oh, what's that? Or some have, 
CCTVs or portable CCTVs or they use other magnifiers, other devices, different glare shields, I mean anything. And so um, it can be a good, like I said, a great conversation starter. Other kids are typically pretty interested in some of the cool devices that like the TVIs have for the students. They all have really cool tech stuff that I don't get to have. I get to see them use it, but I don't get to have it. Um, and so often, you know, it can be a really fun thing to uh, to have with your students to sort of be like, oh yeah, this is this is what I use. This is how I use it. This is why I use it. Um, and that can be pretty neat. And, and we do that with the cane as well. Um, there is no age requirement to use a cane. So the earlier I can get a cane into someone's hands, the better. So what that then goes to is the earlier we can get referrals for a, a child who has a visual impairment and needs an assessment, the better. Um, the, I think the, the youngest I've had is six months old, which is like the best. Uh, so even pre-walking, you know, it's really working with the families and the parents of how do you, you know, what are the best ways to stimulate vision and work on reaching, that sort of thing. Um, and then you can use a cane for as long as you need to. There are different materials that we can make it lighter and things like that. Um, so that's the cane. Uh, so the next few slides sort of are about environmental accommodations, and those are going to those are the biggest things that we find in schools that we have the most sort of um, that we, we do the most with, I guess. So the image here is a, a picture of a descending stairs, and it's got a red, a, excuse me, a yellow and black striped tape going down the edge of the stair. Um, so physical accommodations. Uh, may be recommended to make the school more safe and accessible. So marking stairs, it could be with yellow and black, it could be with any color. So if you just have one student in your school building that is visually impaired, they may have a preferred color that they can see and they want, that's what they want things marked with high contrast. I had a student who's the only kid, he wanted bright orange. So he went with bright orange. Um, in schools where it's multiple students, I kind of split the difference. So I have to make sure that I work with all their different teams and the students to figure out what would be the best color to mark these stairs. We mark um, most uh, main stairs, doorways, door frames, um, and I will work with, uh, we work with facilities to make sure that they have the correct tape to be able to do that, or if they want to go with a paint option, they can do that. We look at interior and exterior. Um, um, places that may need to be uh, marked. So that's including playgrounds, curbings, playground equipment, things like that. That is all part of our assessment for an, what's called an environmental assessment is what we do. Go to the next slide. So again, we do stairs, we can do benches, we look at bleachers, we look at how can this, what is the way to, um, are there any ways that we can mark these things for high contrast visibility so that a student can access this environment safely. And we find that often it, it helps with everybody. So um, we start marking stuff and they're like, oh, I didn't really, like that actually really helps. Um, and I'm not visually impaired. Uh, so those things, you know, often can be really helpful um, for someone who even isn't um, visually impaired. So you're good. So go to the next slide. So uh, this is just sort of thrown in and just so you all are aware there, um, some of you may have had to do this and, and others, it's just sort of a basic technique that I te teach. If I'm not gonna teach anything else, I teach human guide. And it is just a way for someone who's visually impaired to receive assistance to navigate through an environment if they need it. Um, and so it's, oh, you offer your, your elbow, your, your arm, depending on who you're working with. If it's a little, a little one, you often will give them your wrist and they can hold on to your wrist. Um, but it's a way to sort of, uh, again, navigate through an environment that might be really cluttered, busy, um, and just very unfamiliar. Maybe they're just very uncomfortable walking through that environment, and, and you can offer human guide. Um, and what we often do, especially if we're like new to the team or someone's their vision loss is new to, the student is new to a team, um, Myself and the T or the O&Ms and the TVIs often we can work with the, the adults on the team to sort of go all over some of this stuff. How do how would you do human guide? How would you best assist this student um, 
in in particular environments. We do that. We do teacher in services, so we will often um, gather either a whole district or you know whatever, similar to what we're doing today. Um, sort of, and how do you work with a student who's visually impaired, um, and how would you best provide some of that assistance? Uh, the nice thing, the thing about Human Guide is that again, it allows the student or the uh, the visually impaired individual to receive that assistance, but then also to be able to decline the assistance if they don't um, want it and to break away. So, you know, especially with, it happens with adults, but um, it, it happens a lot with little, with younger kids, is that they get pushed through space. So here, Joey, let me take your hand. Oh, you're going to go this way. That's not um, helpful. <laughs> um, and so human guide and knowing how to interact sort of appropriately with someone who's visually impaired, it, it allows that person to be sort of in the driver's seat, so to speak. And so you are providing information to them. You are giving them the opportunity to move through space, but they are not being dragged through space. They're not being pushed through um, an environment where they just, it's just all coming at them all at once. Um, and so doing something like human guide allows them to sort of take in some of that that environment in a nice way. Um, so next slide. <clears throat> Excuse me. So some of the things I think that if you're going to take anything away um, is just kind of supportive strategies on how best to work with and how to interact with a student. Um, the big thing that I, you know, the first thing that my colleague had on here was you always address a student by their name and introduce yourself when you're approaching them or if you've come into a room and they're in that room, you always say, good morning, so and so, it's, I'm, it's Esther. Um, even if they, even if they're expecting you, even if um, you think they recognize your voice. The other thing I would say, especially, and I see this with my young students, particularly elementary age, is never say, oh, hi, so-and-so, do you know who this is? And have them guess. We don't do that. <laughs> um, it's, it's embarrassing. It's frustrating. Um, it's, not, it's not it. So <laughs> you always just sort of offer that introduction of, hello, it's Esther. Um, or uh, if you're approaching someone and they're standing, you say, it's Esther, I'm on your right side. I'm on your, I'm on your left. You give them that information so you're not startling them, um, even if you think they may see you, because they might see you, but it's sort of common courtesy just to kind of give that information. You want to be really respectful of a child's body. That's sort of given. Um, it's, it's, it's extension of their eyes. So providing hand underhand versus hand overhand. I always, 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 again, even if I know that a student can see what I'm doing, I will always tell them what I am doing. So I always say, um, may I take your hand? May I, um, may I shake your hand? May I touch your shoulder? May I do these things? And so they know that I am now coming into their personal bubble. And they, and they may decline and say, nope, I'll take your hand. Or nope, I'll, let's, because um, often we do tactile information like on the palm of a hand. If we're reviewing a map, we'll sort of say, oh, here you do this, and we kind of draw it on their hand. Um, so I always sort of verbalize that. Um, which many probably already do, but um, a big thing is to allow for extra time, not only for processing information, but to allow for the student to like do it themselves. Um, it, what, what I'm seeing um, a lot, well, not a lot, but what we're seeing is a rise in actually um, what's called a cortical visual impairment. It is a brain impairment. It is not an ocular impairment. So a student may have been born prematurely um, they may have had a stroke, uh, they may have had some sort of trauma that um, causes a, basically a traumatic brain injury. Um, and so that impacts processing time. So we have to give our students time to process the information that they're receiving and then to act on that. Um, but that also goes to, that's the same for even a, a student with an ocular impairment. You have to sort of take a step back, close your mouth, let them do it. And then you say, and then give them enough time. And I find with the students that I have, I mean, we've been with them for typically for a while. And so we have sort of that relationship where they know, I know how much time they typically need, or they know to say, mm, I, I, need, I need some help. 
And so that, again, goes back into the advocacy thing of they know when they need that help and when they need someone to sort of step in. Um, so a child may not notice uh, cues of what's happening around them so that they can prepare for what's happening next. Um, so things can happen really suddenly, like fire drills, changes in the schedule, things like that. So as much as you are able to, it's not always possible, but as much as you're able to is to give heads up, to give warning for students so that they can prepare to know what they then need to do. Um, and in relation to O&M, again, it goes like I think about fire drills. So if you know that a fire drill is coming up uh, during the course of a day and you know where that student is going to be, you could give them a heads up and they can prepare. Um, and we often, for O&M instructors, we go through all that as well. So when a student comes to us, that's part of what we do. We work on like, if you're going to have a fire drill, how are you going to get out? How, what is the routine for a fire drill when you are, um, when you're in this particular classroom, whatever it is. Um, so those are all skills. And it, again, you don't even, sometimes I don't think people think about that, that that is a skill and a, a routine that a student needs to learn. And that is something that we will teach them how to do. Um, we can't, we, it's, as much as we can avoid springing stuff on someone, we try to do. It's not always possible. And, and that is also a teachable moment for a lot of our students of like, we can't always give you a heads up. So how are you gonna think on the fly and how are you gonna handle this? Um, and what do you need to do to be able to mitigate any um, potential for like issues <laughs> when those things come up? Um, so, and the last few things on this slide are just being mindful of the environment and how it may impact a child. And I think this kind of goes, this has been sort of addressed for everyone, not just our visually impaired students, but sounds, smells, lights, temperatures, all those things, textures can be a real trigger um, for folks. Um, explaining what's going on when there's unusual noises um, and trying to be as detailed as you possibly can as, as is appropriate. Um, and then stressors can affect a child's ability to process. So if there's a lot of noise, um, if there's a lot of movement chaos, they can be really, it can be a real struggle. Um, and then encouraging positive social skills and relationships. This again goes back to the expanded core curriculum. So there are there's nine areas of ECC, and one of them is um, uh, like social skills and relationships. Those are things that incidentally we as sighted as individuals learn. We learn how we read faces, we read body language, we read posture, we we know how to interpret those things because we're getting them visually. Our students are not getting those things, and so we teach those things. Um, and it's the helpful thing, I guess, is again, up until when O&M or TVI or whatever are involved, a lot of that falls onto the parents and it can be really stressful. It, some, most of our students' parents are just, they're just trying to get by with a visually impaired child in a world that is not made for their visually impaired child. Um, and so when we come in, we can kind of help support them and get, and do the teaching that is often very, it's a lot of work to do on your own. Um, so, and again, this, this slide is just some more supportive strategies. So being um, mindful that each student is an individual with their own individual needs and abilities, um, using consistent descriptive language, and that can take some practice um, and sort of reminders of like, oh, I need to, I don't use terms like over there, over here, right here, um, be very specific about your directional terms. Be very specific about as, as specific as you can be if you're trying to describe an item to a, a student. Using as many real life examples as you possibly can. So earlier today, actually, Sharice, who made this PowerPoint, she talked about a student who, as a as a little student, as a tiny human, <laughs> was introduced to a like a toy cow two by two little toy plastic cow. And for a long, long time, she assumed that that was a cow. And so they were like, oh, we're gonna go to a dairy farm. And she was like, oh, what? Like, how are you gonna get, like, that's a, a cow is this? And so she was blown away when she saw a real life cow and got to explore a real life cow because in her mind, she was only ever exposed to little tiny toy cows. So that's a big part of what we do as instructors. It may not seem, it seems like we're just kind of 
gallivanting in the community and it's wonderful it is part of that but we're exposing these students to these real things that they may not conceptually understand otherwise so they're touching they're getting into they're they're seeing a cow up close they're going and realizing that like a car is not just a little matchbox car there's a full big and there's different types of cars and trucks and and other things in their environment that they may not ever have been exposed to um, and we try to do all of that as a, when a student is young because it doesn't always happen or it may happen and then someone a student may go through their life they never use those things especially again in maine we don't have a ton um, and you end up with a 40 year old vr client who has no concept of certain things because they have just never been exposed to them so you're teaching those things to someone who's an adult and we would assume oh well you should have this well they don't because they just never were exposed to it um, so the last thing here says don't be afraid to ask we're a part of the team um, and I, I don't know if the rest of this gets into it but the big challenge that we find as o and instructors is being included as part of the team because we are kind of on the fringes especially if a student doesn't need regular mobility training or if they're really getting more of that community-based training it can be hard for folks to remember like oh yep we have to include the o and instructor um, because we are a major part of each um, education team um, because again it's all connected even if we're not working solely at the school um, it's all sort of connected and will only benefit a student for the rest of their educational career so um, again my name is esther i'm the bottom one i'm out of bangor my colleague alicia is out of augusta but there are like seven or eight of nine others um, <laughs> throughout the state and we are involved in a like sort of again it's a spectrum so we might be really heavily involved with the student or and providing direct instruction or we can do uh, consult services and so we provide what consult means as from what i understand is that consult is the continuation of a direct goal that had been worked on and we are the continuation of like making sure that that goal is continuing to be um, achieved or we can act as a resource so if a student really does, we've done assessments we've determined that they don't need any sort of direct or consult services at this point we can be a resource for your team so you can reach out to any of us at any time emails questions we don't have to be directly involved um, with a student to just give you some guidance um, if then it gets it can then can progress into something more and then maybe we do need to be involved and included on the team but um, we often work as a resource and act as a resource because we're, we're always available and we can answer questions, we can do trainings, that sort of thing um, is always available to you folks as well. That's kind of it. Hopefully that's oh, another question. Julie, can you check the um, chat box, please? I'm not used to working on one screen here. It's throwing me a bit. You are on mute. You're still on mute. <laughs> there. <laughs> there are no questions in the chat box. Um, there was just the link that Ashley had put in there. All right. Thank you. Good. Let well, me. Um, oh, my goodness. Now I'm stuck here. Thank you so much, Esther. That was really awesome. You're welcome. And like I said, we can always do trainings or if you have questions, feel free to email any of us. Um, we're always available. Awesome. The coolest thing I ever learned was from a TVI and it was the Braille thing, with the buttons, and that the, the six buttons are the Braille. If you move them, that was, blew me away. Yeah, so cool. is fascinating. I can read it. I can't do it tactfully, but I can visually read it. So, oh, really? It's, That's it's, very cool. It's fascinating for sure. And you can see those kids, they're just zipping right along. It's yeah. Bonkers. Well, I mean, how awesome is it that the, the Braille writer is the Braille? Like, yeah. It's cool. just, it just makes so much sense that it's a mate. It just blows me away that somebody thought to do that. Anyway. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> anyway. <laughs>
All right, these are our upcoming um, PD opportunities. And these are registration links attached. Um, if you wanna share them with your gen ed teacher friends, related service providers, we love that. And this will get you to our um, feedback and contact hour form. Fill out the feedback, we love it. And um, you will, Carly will send you contact hour, put in your email address and choose Office hours, orientation and mobility, I'm guessing. It's probably yeah, a double, right? I mean, my guess is, is there's probably a date, too. It's probably today's date. I think date. she's usually good about dating it. So Okay. It's a date. It's a date. <laughs> <laughs> this um, second link here goes to our professional learning page. All of our PD is recorded and put up there, and it's super easy to navigate. And here is our contact information again. So thank you, Esther, and thank you, everybody, for coming.